prepare for those very moments. All right. Well, we're ahead of schedule, and I won't stop us from having a long break. So, um, my name is. Oh, I want to present this thing. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, too many apps, play on words, obviously, um, two small apps that we've created uh, using collaboratory notebooks, and the idea behind this is that uh, collaboratory notebooks kind of already have a use, and we're using them in this experimental way to create self-contained apps. Um, so, I'm Luke Ashman, and I work at uh, NCSU Libraries in the Digital Library Initiative Department. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, if he puts it on, it'll work. Oh, okay. Ah, uh, yes. The magic on. <laughs> um, so, you're probably asking yourself, so what are collaboratory notebooks? So, this is uh, straight from their, their a, um, collaboratory notebooks is a free Jupyter notebook environment that run, requires no setup and runs entirely in the cloud. This is, they're created by Google because they're hosted in Google Drive, so this is Google's definition. So let's break this down a little bit. First, they are a Jupyter notebook, and so you're probably asking yourself, what is a Jupyter notebook? Uh, so Jupyter notebooks are, the simplest definition is that uh, they are a mixture of live code and a Word document. Um, and so some uses, they originally got started in scientific computing, so it allows when, you're, when you have these really complex scientific computing calculations, it allows students to like read about the calculation and then there'd be a little bit of code that they could explore and mess with. So it's teaching them both the code behind the calculation but also the, the actual the philosophy <coughs> behind it as well. Um, at NCSU, we've been experimenting with Jupyter Notebooks for a little while. Um, so first, uh, for support coding workshops, so how do you run Python code? How, you know, what is pandas and numpy? What do you use these for? So what we'll do is we'll give a workshop where um, it's kind of a self-contained tutorial where the student will read kind of step-by-step -step instructions, but then be able to mess with the code blocks. Um, we've also used them in prototyping uh, machine and deep learning, so it's a quick way to get to some Python environments and run some, um, some of like TensorFlow, some of the pack, uh, Python packages that power machine and deep learning. But um, where collaboratory notebooks really, are really um, take advantage is uh, they require no setup, and they run entirely in the cloud or in your browser. And so the advantage of this is, you know, a traditional Jupyter notebook, you have to install it on your local machine, you have to set it up and manage your packages and everything. But a collaboratory notebook, you double click, you create a new document, and boom, it's up and running and ready to go. Which made us think, um, is there a way that we can use this kind of self-contained environment to create uh, small applications? So before I go into that, I just wanted to give you a, a sample of what a collaboratory notebook looks like. So here you can see the mixture of, uh, you know, at the top you have your standard Google Drive toolbar, uh, and this gives you features like, is that is that hard to see? Yeah, it's a little hard to see, I apologize. Um, but you can comment, you can share these notebooks, you can create duplicates of them, and then the main portion of this is looks like your standard Jupyter notebook with, uh, you can see there's text, these steps that this person needs to do, and then in the center there you can, it's kind of gray, it's a little washed out, but um, you can see some Python code where it says hit install. Um, so, uh, onto creating apps. Um, so, I'm sure that some, there are developers in the room, how often does somebody come up to you and say this? <laughs> happens to me a lot. Um, and this is typically how apps get started, right? Somebody has an idea. And when somebody comes up to me and says this, I typically think uh, what they want is a programmatic solution for a manual process they're already doing. And so I'll sit down with them and we'll have a consultation and we'll, we'll try to identify what the actual need is. Um, and then we have to decide um, what are we going to, how are we going to make this up? What are we going to use? And so I've created a little chart here just to give you some examples of where I think we might be. Uh, so from left to right um, on this on this x-axis, you have like simple, uh, so simple and complex apps, and that's just how much can it do. 
And then from top to bottom, you have like the user interface from command line to a graphical user interface. So our first option might be just a simple bash script, right? The simple script, self-contained, running in a command line. But there's not a lot of user interaction there. Um, it has some limitations. So if we, speaking, speaking on the bottom part of this graph, we might use like a CLI, which is really, or a Ruby then, right? It's really complex. Users can run most, multiple commands from it. They can get a lot of input. They can get outputs. Um, and again, these, uh, these are great, but it does require that the user know something about the command line. Um, on the top side, and probably the most common is creating an actual web application and using a framework like this. These are just icons of various frameworks, Drupal, Laravel, Angular, Vue. Um, and these are great, but if it's a real simple need. This is a little bit of overkill. Uh, it, takes a, it takes a while to get these apps up and running. They have a lot of dependencies. Um, so another technique that uh, I've been using a lot in the past is just creating client-side only apps. So these are apps that you can actually compile and run static, on a static web page. Um, and these are, these are pretty nice because they're pretty quick to create. Uh, they don't have quite as much as uh, many dependencies generally as something like Drupal or Laravel um, or Rails. Uh, but the problem is there's this fuzzy, what I call the server barrier. Um, and it could be the most common barrier for these uh, client-side JavaScript apps are processing power. Um, and then the one that I run into a lot is CORS, and that stands for uh, cross-origin resource sharing. So if you're working with an API, you're trying to get data from an API, uh, most browsers block a JavaScript's HTTP request um, if it's not from the same server. And you can configure your API to, to allow JavaScript to make that call, but most servers aren't configured that way. It's actually a very strange phenomenon. Um, it's like, here, have all my data, but you have to use the server to access it. You can't, you can't let a client grab it. Um, and there are some security issues. I'm, I'm kind of I'm being a little flippant about it. Um, but anyway, so the, the idea is that collaboratory notebooks fill this role of they, they give you that server environment. They give you um, control over, um, it's kind of a, an encapsulated server where you can run middleware scripts, uh, Python code. Um, they're not gonna give you, and it's a little bit of, they give you a little bit of graphical user interface as well. It's not gonna be too advanced, uh, so you can't do, you know, you can't make a web app with them, but you can, uh, you can have a little bit of give and take with, the, with user inputs. Um, and so the first app that I wanted to show is, uh, really highlights this, getting around this server barrier. Um, and so at NTSU, we are, um, we're experimenting with integrating ORCID on campus. Most people are familiar with ORCID, Open Researcher ID, so we want all of our researchers to sign up to use ORCID. And before we did this, we wanted to ask, we asked ourselves, how many researchers and students and graduate students, postdocs, how many have uh, ORCID ID? And so we use this collaboratory notebook, which is in the center. Um, we have this giant Google Doc with 15,000 names. And um, the collaboratory notebook queries the Google Doc, grabs a name, queries the ORCID API, does a little bit of analysis on the return, how many, how many people have returned, do they have an NTSU affiliation, and then puts that return back into the Google Doc. So again, it's working, it's essentially working with two, two different systems, and it's the bridge between the two. Um, and it allows us, to, it allowed us to make analyses like this. Um, granted, 50% of those names had no match, uh, but we were, we were, you know, there's, there's some uh, hope in here in that I think a little over 17%, uh, so just under 1,400 users' names, these had, and that is also really tiny, but we found a single matching ORCID that also contained an NTSU affiliation. So that's pretty good coverage considering we only have 2,300 faculty. Um, so the app is nice, but what makes it really great and the fun thing about a collaboratory notebook is um, if you were to click on this link, and I'll find a way to distribute these slides, I did not make a good URL, I apologize. Uh, but if you were to click on this link, you could make a copy of this, you could uh, provide your own link to your own Google Sheet with your own faculty names and hit run, and it would do the exact same thing for you. Anybody can use this, right? You don't need to install anything, you don't need to know what how it works work Python. It has step-by-step -step instructions built into the application on Python 6. Um, 
And this just highlights my point, there's no set. And that's the second thing I wanted to focus on. So um, how many of you have run into this scenario? Yeah, this is a pretty common problem when working with open source software, right? You just can't get the thing to install. Uh, there's tons of roadblocks that, that, um, that are possible, right? The most common is dependencies, right? It's just got a ton of dependencies. And the more dependencies it has, uh, they'll start conflicting with one another, right? It uses this version of, of Node, but this version of Angular, and, and they just say, uh, butt heads. Um, other problems, or another really common problem is just a lack of or outdated documentation. Um, it could be a really, really old open source repository, right? And then finally, a language barrier. And uh, it's funny that I went right after the, uh, the easy part, because it's European, right? I'm sure there was probably some documentation in French. You might find a really great thing, but it's all the documentation in German or French or something, right? Uh, but also, I put language in quotes because it could be a language barrier that the code is written in uh, Ruby, and you just don't know much about Ruby. So there's a language barrier there. And then, actually, my favorite uh, roadblock is this one. <laughs> developers know this pretty well. Um, so because of this, this was an article written two years ago by Brett Davidson, Jason Kazdan at NTSU, and they introduced these indicators. They're stopwatch technology availability performance indicators. It's essentially how fast, given in a piece of open source software, like how fast can you get it up and running, get security on it, take it into production. These are their indicators. And so if we look at a laboratory notebook, um, so time to pilot on a laptop, well, it runs in your browser, so you open the document and it's up and running already. Um, time to export data, so you can export data via Google Drive, you can export data by making a visualization in the notebook itself, so again, it's almost instantaneous. Uh, time to update dependencies and upgrade application, again, these are kind of one and the same. It's integrated with PIP, which is a Python package manager, so on all of my apps, I have step one is, um, is to provision, essentially provision the notebook. And you click the play button, and the pip installs all the necessary packages it needs. Um, time to migrate application, or say duplicate the application. It's like it's just like a Google Doc. So file, make a copy. You have a brand new version of this thing. Um, time to new production deployment. So when you're working with the Python code and it gets saved, it's in production, it's live. And then uh, finally, time to reasonable security. It is it lives in Google Drive, so it has all the necessary security measures that Google Drive provides. Um, so I wanted to get into the second uh, mini app, which capitalizes on this idea of no setup. So we, I was working with a person in collection of research strategies who is often asked to make bibliometric analyses um, for clusters and departments on campus. And so she, um, she typically got her exports from Web of Science, but there were cases where PubMed was actually a better source of data, or at least um, uh, would help uh, expand the data she got from Web of Science. And so, but she is not, uh, you know, she's pretty programming savvy. I'm sure I could have written a, a bash script or a command line tool and she would have been able to pick it up. Uh, but it was just much easier and simpler because we wanted this uh, app to be used, not by her, but anyone on campus or in the libraries that needed to do this type of harvesting from PubMed. Um, so you can see, uh, after you provision the notebook, you provide a list of author names, um, a file name, and then the output, and you can choose either div text or CSV. And it will start, it will, and you click run, and it will, every single author will harvest uh, their citation from PubMed. Um, and the output looks exactly the same because we have control of the output looks exactly the same as an output from Web of Science, either in BibTeX or CSV. So that way, the software, you just throw the data together in a side two or some sort of bibliometric parser, and um, it's, it munches it all together. Uh, so again, um, she has her list of authors, she uses this, somebody else needs to use this app, they can make a copy of it, and they're, they're up and running. Um, and then finally, the last plug I wanted to make on uh, a, a major benefit is uh, error handling. Um, so, there's often a case where uh, we, we get a GitHub issue and it says something like, hey, the, website, the website's down, right? Or I can't, I can't get access to what, right? We don't know what they're talking about. 
Uh, so one of the great things about these collaboratory notebooks is um, when the user, when, when I say the user, I'm saying like the person I've made this for, after they run it, if there's an error, it actually saves that whatever the error was in the notebook itself. You can see what was run. And so, again, this is a little hard to see, but it's just your standard um, uh, execution error. And so somebody says, you know, oh, it's not working. I can open up the notebook and I can see, oh, it's because you, know, you didn't fill in this required piece or something like that. Um, and then I can comment to them, I can email them. There's many ways you can fix it. Sometimes it's because I screwed up and I left like a, I didn't indent correctly for this Python, right? Um, so, uh, so that's just another, it really speeds up the, the process of, of troubleshooting. Um, so the when and why to use collaboratory notebooks, I just uh, wanted to give you some ideas. So first, rapid prototyping. Um, again, really if you're uh, familiar with Python, it's a great way. Boom, instead of having to deal with like, in Python, it's virtual EMV and bit and having to build this environment spin up one of these and start uh, mucking around with Python. Um, simple apps for non-technical end users, so this is where we think there's a real niche for this. Um, so you create this app, it has nice step-by-step -step instructions, it has, you can generate a lot of outputs in Google Drive or on screen, so you hand it off to them. Um, experimenting with Python packages, I'm sure you, if any Python developers out there know there's about 10 packages for every one thing you want to do in Python. So um, if you want to figure out like how they look side by side, you can install them all into this collaboratory notebook and you know run the run the uh, run the code in different cells and then you're good to go. Um, programmatic Google Sheets and Drive manipulation. So if you, I don't know why you would want to replicate something in Google Drive a hundred thousand times, but you could um, because it has access to, to Google Drive and you can manipulate files and edit files. In. And then finally, uh, what, what, I, what I've been using is the most towards API publishing. So somebody gives me, because of that, that cores issue that I run into with JavaScript, um, somebody says, you know, what does this API return look like? Or I want to get everything about this person from this API. It's a real fast and easy way to just to gather data. Um, some other additional features uh, that I have not uh, really, I haven't tinkered with much myself, but I know they're there. Um, so the, it, has, it supports GPU hardware acceleration. So you can do like TensorFlow and deep learning um, experimentation with it because you can say, hey, yes, I would like a GPU on this cloud server environment. Thanks, Google. Um, it is free, by the way. This is not a paid service. Um, you can also export it, uh, export all of your code as a repo or a gist or a Jupyter notebook. So you, you can say, um, if you think that it would be better for you to distribute this as a file as a Jupyter notebook, you can do that as well. And commenting, I say I, I, I've used commenting before, but um, uh, the commenting is just is, is a, a nice feature. You can also do it for, kind of do it for paired, um, uh, paired uh, code development if you wanted to. Um, now, of course, there are limitations. I just, this is kind of the buyer beware sort of thing, except you're not buying anything, so you don't have to worry too much. Uh, it's limited to Python 2 and 3, so you, uh, you do need to have some Python experience. Uh, the, the forms where the user inputs, they're, they're not pretty, right? It does support checkboxes, radio buttons, drop downs, um, but they're, the, uh, the, ver the name of the form variable, like the label, is actually the name of the variable in its code. So if you look at a lot of these collaboratory notebooks, you'll see like orchid underscore API underscore key, right? But what I get around that by just in the, in the text block saying, this is what you should enter in here. So you can get around it. Um, the Google Drive authentic authentication process is just a little clunky. Uh, when you set up the notebook, it, uh, distribute, it displays a URL that you click on, opens a new tab, you authorize Google Drive, and then it, uh, and then it, the notebook has authorization. So it's just not, it's not slick where you just say, yes, I want to authorize, and then it does it for all your collaboratory notebooks. And then the final one, and this is, I guess, a limitation, so discovery. You know, we've made these two that I think are reusable, but how are we going to let you all know where they exist and how to find them and how to use them? Uh, so this is actually where I think this is also an opportunity because I would love for, for this idea to be used 
you know, people making all these tiny miniature apps uh, that can be, can be used, re replicated and reused across the library. Uh, you know, I'd love for it to be a problem to have too many, many apps. Um, so, and if, if we get to that point, uh, I'll be happy to make you know, a static page that collects these all that can be posted on GitHub pages that have some sort of tracing discovery. So if you're really interested and this is something you want to experiment with more, or if you do an experimentation and create an app that you think some people across the library can use, send it to me and I'll, I'll start collecting these and uh, you know, hopefully make some sort of collection at some point. Alright, so with that, um, any questions? I know it's very technical, I went very fast, but I wanted to get you to that point. All right, well thank you very much. So feel free to take a break, grab some more coffee, use the restroom. I'm going to ask that our Lightning Talk folks come, go ahead and come up now, and so that we can grab your USB drives and load up your presentations. Thanks, y'all.